Welcome to Native America Calling, I'm Sean Spruce. Organizers of the Pivot Art Exhibit say the name reflects the ability of indigenous people to thrive in a world constructed mostly by a non-native majority, while also drawing on the tenets of traditional culture. In this case, artists express their cultural inspirations on skateboards. Hundreds of the works are now on display at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque. We'll hear about it coming up after the news. This is National Native News. I'm Megan Kemrick in for Antonia Gonzalez. A new bill just signed in Washington state creating an alert system for missing indigenous people could be a model for other states. The Olympian reports the bill signed by Governor Jay Inslee is the first to establish an alert system for missing indigenous people. The bill was introduced by state representative Deborah Lakanoff, the only native person in Washington's legislature, and was created in consultation with area tribes. The bill creates a hotline to take in reports from the public and alerts law enforcement officials and sends out public messages when Indigenous people go missing. The system is similar to the Amber Alert System for children who have been abducted. The Olympian reports State Attorney General Bob Ferguson says other states have already contacted him about implementing similar legislation elsewhere. The Navajo Nation is considering repealing its ban on same-sex marriage. Emma Gibson from the Mountain West News Bureau has more. The Navajo Nation lies within Arizona, Utah, and New Mexico and has approximately 400,000 members. Almost 20 years ago, it banned same-sex marriages. All Ray Nelson heads the LGBTQ Indigenous Advocacy Group Navajo Nation Pride. He says the ban has resulted in problems for partners who want to adopt, build a house, have joint health insurance, and more. In order for us to really feel safe in our own communities living on the Navajo Nation, the nation has to open up its doors and send a message to the rest of the country that the largest tribal nation in the United States is inclusive and you're a part of our family. He estimates out of the 574 federally recognized tribes in the U.S., there are about a dozen bands still in place. The proposal will next go to one of the tribal government's committees. That was Emma Gibson from the Mountain West News Bureau. A tribe in Connecticut is supporting a town's continued use of a mascot that includes an arrowhead and a profile of a native man. NBC Connecticut reports the Scaticoke Tribal Nation passed a resolution recently to support the city of Derby using the nickname Red Raiders and the logos as the town tries to retain funding that is jeopardized by its use of the mascot and imagery for local school athletic teams. According to a resolution passed by the Tribal Council, it supports the use of the images as, quote, a public means of sustaining Native American culture and history of Connecticut's first citizens. Under a law passed last year, Connecticut municipalities whose athletic teams use Native American names or mascots must get written support from a state or federally recognized tribe. Failing to do so means possibly losing grants funded by revenue from the state's two tribal casinos. Tribal and federal officials say an agreement to hand over more than 400 acres of land to the Rappahannock tribe in Virginia is a triumph of collaboration among the tribe, the federal government, and private landowners. The agreement returns a portion of the tribe's ancestral homeland along the Rappahannock River. The tribe will manage conservation and management with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In a statement, Interior Secretary Deborah Holland said the department looks forward to drawing on tribal expertise and indigenous knowledge toward managing the area's wildlife and habitat. The agreement creates a permanent conservation easement that restricts how the sacred land can be used. And new DNA evidence has confirmed what a tribe in California has always maintained, that it is not extinct. USA Today reports an anthropologist wrote in 1925 that the Muekma Olon tribe from the San Francisco Bay Area was, quote, extinct for all practical purposes. But the tribe has always disputed that claim, and now living Olon tribal members have found a DNA link to their ancestors. A study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found genetic links between current tribal members and ancient inhabitants of the Bay Area. It used a type of genomic research that's only been developed over the last decade. For National Native News, I'm Megan Kamrick.
National Native News is produced by Kiwanak Broadcast Corporation with funding by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Support by the Gathering of Nations Powwow, a live event taking place April 29th and 30th on the powwow grounds of Expo New Mexico, featuring song, dance, trader's market, horse parade, and more. Tickets available at gatheringofnations.com and at the gates. Support for law and justice-related programming provided by Hobbs, Strauss, Dean and Walker, a national law firm dedicated to promoting and defending tribal rights for nearly 40 years. More information available at HobbsStrauss.com. Native Voice One, the Native American Radio Network. This is Native America Calling. I'm Sean Spruce. Designs you might normally see on fragile Pueblo pottery, textiles, and jewelry are painted, etched, and burned into the backs of dozens of skateboard decks. They're part of the new Pivot exhibit at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center in Albuquerque. If you visit, you might see two-dimensional animals from Plains Ledger Artists, bold form line marine mammals from the Pacific Northwest, and beautiful floral designs inspired by Midwestern native painters. By highlighting the skateboard, the artists in the exhibit are showing viewers another layer of contemporary Native life. And with deck art, they're illustrating what it looks like to pivot and shift through everyday life as a young Native person. In the rest of this hour, we'll talk with the curators of the pivot exhibit and a few of the artists who are featured. Deck art is having a moment right now. You can join today's conversation. If you're a skateboarder, what do the stickers and graphics on your deck say about you? Join us by calling 1-800-996-2848. That's also 1-800-99-NATIVE. Landis Bahi is the creator and co-curator of the Pivot Exhibit. He's Diné, a tattoo artist and painter who is speaking with us today from Flagstaff, Arizona. Welcome to Native America Calling, Landis. Hey, thank you, Sean. It's good to meet you, man. Thanks for having us on the show and thanks for... uh getting us up on here to talk about the Pivot exhibit. You bet, Landis, you bet. Also joining us is Candice Quam. She is the co-curator of the Pivot exhibit and is speaking with us from Zuni, New Mexico, and she is Zuni. Candice, welcome to the show as well. Hey, thanks for having us on. I'm super excited for this. As am I. Uh, Landis, uh, Native Skateboard Art, super cool stuff. Congratulations on the new exhibit. Thank you. Appreciate it. I, Yeah, absolutely. And, and I see so much creative contemporary Native art featuring everyday items and equipment. So it makes sense that skateboards fit so nicely into that realm. Now, you're the in addition to being uh, one of the, the curators, you're also the creator of the exhibit. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested, what sparked your interest in this kind of art? Um, you know, um, we just being Native American and just being an artist, you know, you're just around it. You're attending these shows and all that. The pivot is just an idea happened, you know, based on the surroundings that I was around, you know. Some of those surroundings was actually where I had a tattoo was in Las Vegas, Nevada. And uh, they have a lot of tattoo shops there and a lot of them actually throw... Um, skateboard deck art shows one of the biggest uh, shows that I, that I witnessed when I was over there um, tattooing was was done by a gentleman called uh, his name is uh, Jimmy Litwalk and he uh, threw a show called deck the halls and it was all skateboard deck, deck art from all tattoo artists it was I thought the name was super super uh, super good so it stuck with me for years uh, you know a few years later then and we thought about pivot pivot exhibit. Now, there obviously there's this connection between tattoo art and skateboard art, deck art. Um, when did this kind of when did this really take off? Deck art. You know, um, you can't really talk about Native American skateboard deck art if you don't include uh, the name Douglas Miles. You know, Douglas Miles is, you know, he's he, he's got about, you know, a few years on me, definitely years of experience. You know, he's a wise person, um, very cool guy, too. Um, so he actually, you know, kind of put it out there. 
um, as far as when he did it himself, but as far as the pivot, the pivot is actually, I believe, to be one of the first that had us all collectively going in there and doing it together, which it actually included him along the journey as well, and he contributed a large amount of his energy towards the pivot exhibit. Now, talking about pivot, uh, how many skateboards are there currently in the exhibit there at the cultural center? Um, I believe that there's about 150 approximately. Um, I believe there's about 130, uh, I think it's about 36 approximate artists as well. You know, sometimes that number kind of escapes me, but that's approximate numbers there. And there, are there any specific rules for the types of skateboards that can be used in the exhibit or the style of art for the exhibit? Well, what Candice um, leading the way has done in selecting the artists is, um, you know, we look at what they're doing, you know, what they're, you know, what, what they're doing. So we're, we come from, you know, doing the art markets and we come from a place where we're doing the, the shows. So the person in the booth next to you comes to fun at the end of the market weekend and you're all a family at the end of the, you know, you do this thing for about five, 10 years, you know, your family, you know, you see kids grow up and grandkids come through. So we asked people that we knew and we knew what type of work that they brought. As far as rules, it was just basically, you know, it's a gallery, you know, um, uh, the pivot exhibits are currently up there in the South gallery in the Pueblo cultural center. And another thing is just tell them it's got to be on skateboard and kids are going to be looking at it. And you really don't have to say too much after that. And they bring, and we want them to bring them, you know what I mean? And that's, I believe that's when, uh, you know, that's when, that's when you know you're going to get the, the, the most from them, you know, because a lot of these artists, all of them are very giving. They got big hearts. And when you can just give them the platform to, to do that, you know, within the restraints of a skateboard and, you know, the kids are going to be there, you know, that's, a, that's pretty limited rules, you know. So it's, it's, it's a really nice um, eye candy, <laughs> you know what I mean? For those sure, are sure. for, uh, really nice art. Okay. Um, Candice, uh, I, I want to wish you congratulations as well on Pivot. And tell us a little bit more about it. I mean, what does it mean to you, Pivot? Yeah, sure. So this was actually my first exhibit as a co-curator for Pivot. I was an artist, or just an artist, uh, these past couple of um, showing so it was super exciting and nerve-wracking to really put my spin on this with the help of Landis he was super helpful in like helping me along but uh yeah pivot is to me like really something new and different and exciting just a new you have to put yourself in a different mindset because it's not canvas it's not on a wall it's not a mural it's a wooden skateboard so you kind of have to shift your thinking from like, how is this going to look to, like, how is it going to look with the curves? How can I work with the wood? There's a lot of things that you need to kind of take into consideration, but in that, it's sort of freeing. Like, you have something new to work on, and you can put your own spin on it, whatever spin you want to, and I really like that. And you can create a dialogue with, like, the older generation who loves Native art and the younger generation who doesn't know how Native art can be put on, and it can be transformed into so many different ways that we have a new exhibit. So I think it's really cool. Now, are you a skateboarder as well, Candace? I was back in college, but uh, as I'm getting older, I'm getting more clumsy. So <laughs> and I'm not as a fan of getting hurt <laughs> now that I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that for sure. Candace, I understand there are a lot of hummingbirds in this exhibit. Can you enlighten us on the significance of the hummingbird? Sure. So for multiple tribes, hummingbirds are seen as a messenger from our ancestors, I can't say that for everybody else, but I can say that for Zuni. Uh, they're seen as a messengers, and they kind of help change the seasons as well from winter to summertime. Plus okay. Comes in, now, plus the message of hummingbirds comes into, like, trend every couple of years. So this happens to be one of the trending years. Got it. it really, really fascinating. And Candace, skateboarding culture is known for being individualistic and free thinking. And can we see those types of values depicted in the exhibit? 
Yeah, you can see all sorts of how people express themselves in their culture is very evident. Even people from the same tribe, they don't put the same thing on the board. It's super cool to see and just to see how everybody put their own spin on it is really fun. Fascinating. Now, Landis, I understand that Pivot's going to be uh, there at the Pueblo Cultural Center for about a year. It just opened last uh, or in February, and it'll go for all the way through until 2023. But this is not the first year of Pivot, right? How long has it been going on, Landis? You know, Pivot's been going on for, you know, I think since 2018, I believe. It started in my tattoo shop that I used to be partners with. Right here in Flagstaff, Arizona, we had a little small room on the south side of town, and we, 4th of July weekend, I just got together and just said, let's just throw down some skateboard decks and let's just do this, you know, basically. What it's representing, Pivot, the name is, you know, us as Native Americans, I think that we can all relate to this to some degree, is we're not currently living in a world that is of our own. So how much of that is integrated by choice and that is of not our own choosing, a lot of that kind of comes into the show, you know. So it's been going on for about six years or so, and it's really blossomed, and, you know, everything's been really looking really nice on it. Well, listeners, do you remember your first skateboard? I remember mine. It was a clunky plastic board with old cast metal trucks. And I was eight years old, and I remember my mom didn't want to buy it. So I wrote a letter to my grandparents explaining that all the other kids had skateboards and how much I wanted one too. And what do you know? It wasn't long before some money came in the mail, and I had my skateboard. So don't ever underestimate the power of a pining grandchild. Folks, we are talking about skateboard deck art today, and we have a couple of curators from this really, really exciting new exhibition there at the Pueblo Cultural Center called Pivot. And we're talking with them today, and we're also going to have some deck artists on the show who are going to talk with us about the actual artwork that they have on display there at the Cultural Center. So really a fun show today. Lots of cool things going on artistically with skateboard decks and pop culture as well. So if you have a question or a comment, give us a holler, 1-800-996-2848. I'm your host, Sean Spruce, and we'll be back right after this break. The Great Salt Lake in Utah is drying up. A combination of climate change and water demand is taking its toll on the lake and the surrounding basin. The trend affects a number of tribes, many of which say the solutions are within reach with adequate resolve and consultation. We'll hear more on the next Native America Calling. Mesa Lands Community College can help you lead the way in your chosen field. At Mesa Lands, where one in three students is Native American, you get hands-on opportunities working one-on-one with instructors in wind energy, where students go up the turbine in their first semester, silversmithing with access to the largest foundry in the Southwest, and blacksmithing in the cowboy arts. Mesa Lands has a national top 10 rodeo team, too. Info and applications at mesalands.edu. Mesa Lands Community College supports this program. Welcome back. You're listening to Native America Calling. I'm Sean Spruce. The Airwalk, Alley Oop, Casper Flip, and Full Cab. If you're not familiar with the splashy names of various skateboard tricks, that's okay. Today's show is for both skaters and non-skaters alike. The deck, the wooden area of a skateboard that a person stands on, can be a canvas for skaters to express their inspirations. And a new art exhibit challenges Native artists to come up with deck graphics drawn from culture. Please join the conversation by calling 1-800-996-2848. That's 1-800-996-2848. In Zuni, New Mexico, we have Leanne Lee. She's an artist and she's also Zuni. Leanne, I understand you have a couple of boards in this exhibit. Hi, yes, I do. Tell us more about them. Um, so I created four skateboards, um, all which have uh, mandala painted on them um, and those mandalas are um, a representation um, of healing and meditation and just 
um, being able to express myself as a person. Um, when I was a uh, um, younger, I was going through a lot of, um, um, I guess you could call it a trauma, but um, in in our Zuni ways, we're not really allowed to talk upon it and express it. Um, so I wanted to actually um, approach it in a different way, and I used uh, mandalas as a way to kind of um, put that out there and uh, raise awareness for others that, you know, can't speak upon whatever they're going through. And, um, yeah, I, I was just really excited that I was able to put more mandalas um, on skateboards rather than just canvas. Now, Leanne, what's been the feedback for these boards that you have on the show? I've gotten really good feedback. Uh, I was actually surprised because um, this is the first time that I've ever really submitted under anything um, of my own, under my name, that's not associated with um, my husband's work. Me and him are a team, and we have a a business called Idakiar, and usually they're submitted as as that way, but um, this is the first time I kind of stepped out of that comfort zone and um, got a lot of feedback of how how bright and colorful they can be and just the stories that are behind, behind the designing um, of them all and just um, actually being asked more to talk more about um, my boards. I was, I was really um, shocked by myself because not only was I um, invited to talk today um, with the radio show, but I was also asked um, to go and do a little talk for um, an Albuquerque school about the boards and the pivot um, next week. So I, I, it's, I've gotten a lot of good feedback from them. Well, right on. Now, was this your first time doing art on skateboard decks, or have you done previous boards in the past? I've I've um, collaborated on previous boards, but this is like the first time that I've actually been able to create and um, do the whole designing myself. Now, are you a skater as well? No, I'm not. Um, uh, I have a daughter that wants to be a skater, and... I've been wanting to uh, learn so that way I can help her as well. <laughs> well, again, congratulations on having your art featured in Pivot and, and so so grateful that you're able to join us today. Leanne, thank you again for being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. Also joining us from Zuni, New Mexico is Elroy Natachu Jr., He's also an artist, and he's Zuni, and he has some skateboard decks here at Pivot as well. Elroy, welcome to NAC. Hi there. Thank you for having me. Elroy, tell us more about the boards that you have in the exhibit. So for this exhibit in particular, what I focused on mainly was traditional pottery designs and textile designs ranging from around 1700s, early 1800s. The main focus of it was to reintroduce a lot of these symbology as well as interpretations for these Pueblo potteries. And the pottery designs that I focused on primarily are early uh, Zuni designs as well as designs found in ancestral sites like Awatovi, and then the last board actually had a combination of old and Pueblo textiles. Oftentimes, you can find these depicted on murals at um, oftentimes known as uh, Kiva murals and things of that nature, utilizing the dot in the eye textile, which is extinct in terms of wearing as well as the interpretations. A lot of times that knowledge base got lost over time and it's sort of one of my missions is to reintroduce a lot of this ancient cultural knowledge that we all had at one time back into these communities. Now, Roy, I know there are a couple of serpents in the exhibit and it's a serpent from Zuni creation stories, right? Could you tell us a little bit more about that character? 
It varies from Pueblo to Pueblo. Most Pueblo communities all have what's known as a uh, plume serpent, a feather serpent, an Ivanu. It depends on community to community based on the cultural aspects of how it integrates with that specific Pueblo. But for Zunis, it represents a main figure in our migration stories of the time of the great deluge where he brought the big waters and for us as people here in Zuni he's mainly the protector and guardian of uh, the bodies of water so that's how we interpret that image but it may vary from community to community there are also some depictions of the plume serpent or Ivanu down in uh, Mexico and that region so it just varies uh, from community to community. Now, Elroy, are you a skateboarder in addition to being a skateboard artist? No. <laughs> That's okay. uh, one thing that I am not. Uh, I don't have the fine motor skills to keep myself on a skateboard. Uh, the way I got involved in this project was from that fine art aspect combining the what would be seen as contemporary in terms of using skate decks as a new canvas, so to speak, uh, in terms of their shape and form. It's very similar to pottery, where you have to make your design fit that actual surface area. And sometimes uh, you have to distort the images so that way depending on the perspective or viewing that you're utilizing it changes so that was one thing that i loved about this exhibit was it was sort of testing my fine art ability from going from canvas which is fairly flat to combining that very drastic form of a skateboard and its dimensions you have to kind of take into all the factors, shape, form, and smoothness. And it was a fun sort of and challenging experience. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. And Elroy, uh, about how long did it take you to make each one of these boards that's on display? Uh, the ones on display roughly can take, um, these ones were predominantly uh, using a new medium that I'm still trying to master, which is the use of acrylic spray paint, roughly about four days to complete the process. But when I do the hand-painted uh, works, those can take between a week to two weeks, depending on how much detail I'm putting and the actual amount of surface area that I have to cover. Now, where do you get the boards that you that you paint on? Do you buy those yourself? Yeah, so a lot of times uh, different uh, vendors will have different types of boards based on wood, shape, size. So what's very interesting is the style of boards that are used. Some are using long boards, regular skate decks, um, different dimensions of them. And it's interesting to see everybody's interpretation from one form to another and how they incorporate those imagery into the final product and what's nice about uh, skateboards is they come in multiple shapes and sizes and they're fairly easy to get a hold of until you actually need it which was weird because when both Candace and I were looking for skateboards sometimes they were out of stock so it just gets you keeps you kind of constantly thinking about what possibilities are out there and what other types of skateboard shapes and surfaces and things of that nature that we can utilize to for our own interpretations. Okay. And, and, and Candace, I have a quick question for you. I, there are some really beautiful decks on display that uh, Elroy created and Leanne, as well as the other artists that we're going to talk to in just a, a moment here. And, and I want to ask you, though, Candace, are, are these actual functional boards for daily use? Because it seems like they might be a little too pretty to get banged up on a half pipe. That's a really good question. I get that question a lot. I guess it just depends on the artist. I myself 
And I'm pretty sure Aura would prefer to have it as art. But there's some people in our, in our roster, uh, Dior Greenwood, who does make functional skateboards. And there's a pretty good handful of artists who do create functional skateboards. So uh, I myself am I'm too, <laughs> uh, how, would, how would I say, um, I would prefer it to be it on the wall. But I always say if you want to write it, uh, you can go ahead and do that. Just don't ever tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Elroy, how do you feel about people riding your boards? I'm at the same thought process because <laughs> of that fine art aspect. The amount of detail I put would kind of just bring me to tears, so to speak, if I were to hear that somebody bought this beautiful board that took hours to create and then all of a sudden it's being utilized, which is the main point of skateboards is for their usage. But the way I like to interpret it is utilizing as another fine art piece to kind of bring joy to whoever purchases or happens to collect my work. Sure, sure. And and, and Landis, I want to ask you a question as well as one of the, as the creator and, and one of the co-curators. Um, you know, Native art, we're seeing it on more and more forms of media, different formats and, and like sporting equipment. I know that I'm a hockey fan and, and I've seen some goalies in the National Hockey League who have actually hired native artists to paint designs and graphics on their face masks that they wear in competition. And I've seen footballs, basketball, surfboards, native designs. Uh, Landis, do you have plans to showcase other sports related native art exhibits? Uh, no, not at the moment. I think that what Pivot is doing is just wonderful as far as touching the community and getting out there in front of the youth as far as moving forward into other um, stuff. I don't have any plans to do that. I just have some plans for work. I, <laughs> I just wish the best for Pivot's journey and where it's going to go because it's really a very, very nice show. You know, and I encourage everyone to go see it that's listening. Okay. And we have another artist on the show today joining us from Albuquerque, New Mexico, is Mallory Quitaki. She's an artist and she's Zuni. Mallory, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. You bet. Now, I want to ask you the same question I'm asking everybody today. First and foremost, Mallory, are you a skater? <laughs> I wish I can say I was, but <laughs> unfortunately, no. Um, as uh, Alroy had mentioned, I probably don't have the skills to steady myself on a board. <laughs> okay, I think we're 0 for 5 in um, having any actual skaters on the show today. But hey, that's okay, because tell us more about the boards that you have on display in the exhibit. Um, so I have four decks that I created, and... Um, I really pushed myself beyond um, what I normally do. I mean, the designs and the content are, are you know, it's very, my, very much my style, but the technique um, was different. So each skateboard, um, at least three of them have, uh, well, two of them have um, metal leaf. So for the heart skate deck, I also um, spun that metal leaf, which is normally are usually found on, um, let's say, like lowriders and uh, the, the design work that comes with um, lowriding and, and pinstriping. And so um, I have had a lot of uh, comments about my artwork and uh, saying that my design look, look a lot like pinstriping and that I should, I, I probably have the capability of, of making that um, more mainstream style pinstripes. But um, I did, I took that idea and I have been utilizing it in, um, the way that we create our pottery designs as well. So um, this whole um, series of decks was pretty neat because I got to utilize that pinstriping style and um, metal leafing, but still keeping that Zuni pottery design style. So this was a really neat combination. Now, you mentioned the pinstriping, lowrider style art. Do you use an airbrush then to get those that pinstriping the way you want it to look? Um, the pinstriping itself is all hand done. Um, I use I masked a little bit with a uh, with um, tape, and um, the shading is with an airbrush. But um, any of the scroll work 
any of the um, pretty much uh, lines, the, the thinner lines are all hand done. Um, to me, uh, uh, I've been creating art for quite a while, so a lot of that, the, the straight lines come naturally for us, especially those of us who've um, done pottery also. So the curvature of these decks were um, a little different for me, but I was able to, you know, still uh, hand paint a lot of the, the straight lines and the, the scroll work. And about how long did it take you to do each one of these decks? Um, I would say uh, I'm a pretty quick painter. Each of them took probably overnight. Um, I did utilize spray paint for a couple of them, so it, it kind of has to cure and sit around for a bit. But, um, man, I got real into these because they were uh, the first time I have um, made a skateboard deck, the so absolute first time. So um, when I'm on a roll, I, I, I keep going. So I really wanted to see the outcomes right away. Now, are, are your decks ultimately going to be for sale? What are you going to do with them when the show's over? Um, I would like to see them um, kind of go places that um, are accepting more skate art. Um, I don't know if I um, any other location would allow me to sell, but I have had requests to create custom ones um, in recently after the show. So um, I can, I mean, that's how I've been, um, been heading in that direction. But I would like to, you know, see if um, there's any other opportunity to, to show amongst other um, deck artists like this. For sure. Uh, do you have a comment or question for today's show? Call in 1-800-996-2848. We're talking about skateboard deck art today. We've got curators. We've got artists on the show. You're listening to Native America Calling, and we're going to be back right after this short break. Program support by Amerind. For 35 years, Indian Country has put its trust in Amerind, providing insurance coverage, strengthening Native American communities, protecting tribal sovereignty, and keeping dollars in Indian Country are Amerind's priorities. More information on property, liability, workers' compensation, and commercial auto needs at Amerind.com. That's A M E R I N D.com. Thank you for tuning in to Native America Calling. I'm Sean Spruce. We are focusing on skateboard deck art. If you're not familiar with the terminology, the deck is the underside of a skateboard, and its graphics say a lot about the person the board belongs to. There's still time to join our conversation. How is art that reflects your tribe showing up in contemporary spaces? Please give us a call, 1-800-996-2848, to share your thoughts, your comments, and ask any questions. Candice, I, I want to go back to you and and just learn a little bit more about the inspiration for Pivot and, and what the end goal is. And what would you and, and Landis really like viewers to take away from skateboard culture and this exhibit, Pivot, that you have going on there at the Cultural Center? Yeah, uh, the main thing, the main uh, goal behind Pivot is to open up people's minds, especially the younger generation, to see that. Native art doesn't have to be stagnant. It's ever changing. And just even if you uh, are not an artist yourself, to always kind of encourage other people to kind of take your traditional te um, teachings and or learn to begin with and kind of mold that into your own life and kind of incorporate traditional and modern. So that's the main thing. Okay, incorporating traditional and modern. Do you have any favorite boards on display? Oh, I have a lot, but um, <laughs> it's really hard to to get a favorite down just because I love all of them. And even just unwrapping the decks for the exhibit, it was like Christmas. So I can honestly <laughs> say that it was so fun to see what everybody came up with and uh, and just encouraging everybody that I knew even before I became a curator. Like, hey, have you ever painted on a skateboard? Because you should. All the cool people are doing it. You should. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> it's just really fun to see what everybody's perspective came out. And all the new people I recruited, I'm just so stoked that they could be a part of this and just to see what they came up with. Now, Landis, we've had the opportunity to speak with four of the Pivot artists on the show today. But how many other artists contributed uh, decks for the for the displays? Um. Total, I think we're looking about approximately about 33 to th actually 36 artists that contributed. 
And where can listeners go just to learn more about Pivot and, and, and deck art in general? Well, I mean, deck art is, is it's basically, I, I look at that as its own thing. But if you want to learn and look at a little bit more of the actual skateboards, you can go to the Instagram handle, uh, Pivot, at Pivot Exhibit on IG. Um, you can also just go right there to the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center. The website has some uh, information on the Pivot ex Exhibit. We don't have a website as of yet. Uh, the Pivot Exhibit is definitely something that, um, you know, when you're going into these type of things, you know, it's really nice to have a lot of the creative stuff and the, the you know, the, the juices flowing because it just creates a good avenue for everyone to express themselves and bring a little bit of themselves to the table, which is great. And that was a whole show. And I'm glad that a lot of the artists that came together on this, on your show here today, are expressing themselves because that's what it really does. The pivot exhibit is acknowledging that us Native Americans, we are handling and we're navigating in two worlds. And that's not really easy, you know, but it's beautiful too at the same time. And the skateboard decks, they serve as an avenue to reach the youth and we do workshops with the youth and that's when Pivot Exhibit brings in other people from mental health to come and talk to because it really creates an avenue for us to reach the youth with things that um, have been a part of our, our culture that have been, you know, like mental health, you know, saving us from those things that, that trouble us. And sometimes when we're doing workshops and we're, we're looking at these artists that are just creating these young artists, these children that, some of these children, they came to, from like the bottom of the Grand Canyon from their tribes to come paint with us. And we just slip them a little paper and it just says, this is how you breathe, you breathe when you're stressed out. Three belly mm -hmm. breaths. So behind the scenes, from my, my perspective, you know, like that's what I see Pivot doing. And you get all these other treats. You know, you get... Elroy Nadichu with his vast knowledge of his culture and his experience and the way that he expresses it, his storytelling, you know, Candace Kwam and you have Jeremy Singer and Jarrell Singer and you got all the Ryan Singer of pop art. And then, you know, like there, I don't know much about museum curation. I'm still new to it. You know, I'm about five years in doing cur cur curating and guest curator. And when I go in, it's like, <laughs> I want to be the main curator, you know, <laughs> but what it does is, you know, I don't know. I don't know if there's another show that um, has this much heart made by okay. hands. You know what I mean? It's just, right, it's right. incredible. You get well, that and, and then you get the workshops and all this, you know, there's a lot going uh, on. Yeah, this multi-dimensional approach, like you mentioned, the hands-on aspect, that's what makes it so cool. It's interactive in a sense. And and, and you mentioned like other shows. Are there other people in, in, in uh, Native America that are doing similar types of shows with regard to deck art and other contemporary uh, approaches to, to teaching Native art and, and promoting Native art the way you're doing there at Pivot? Well, Pivot is its in, in its own, you know, and that's what's, that's what's wonderful is that it grows the way it grows, you know, and every person that is a part of Pivot grow, has, has it grow the way it does in them. So it just, it fractals off into that aspect. You know, whatever somebody else is doing, I hope that Pivot it allows not only young children that are, you know, they have the culture and then, they, then, then they're living in a different world. They can, they have an avenue to express themselves. Say, hey, it's okay that I can express myself on a skateboard deck. You know, it doesn't have to be this. I can do what I, what I, what I, what I feel. I can do what I, you know, art is healing, you know, and then going into uh, fractaling off and hopefully it inspires somebody else to do what they're doing, you know, but staying, mm -hmm. you know, as far as like offering a very eclectic show that is authentically cultured, inspired by, by artists is the treat that we are offering. You know, all these artists, they put a lot of time and these artists are super busy, you know, <laughs> right, and they put right, their yeah. time into a skateboard deck and it's such a great show. I encourage yet again, you know, if you haven't seen it, you know, go in person 
the walls are decorated. We've decorated Candace, put her hands on the walls and, and de- decorated with, with imagery that is conducive to the energy of pivot, like um, having arrowheads there that, that protect it. That is not a symbol of, you know, somebody winning a game, you know, and, and it can be in certain instances, but like it's to protect, it's for protection there, you know, or sure. like, you know, the, the, the things that are, that are there, they're, they're a part of nature. You talked we talked about hummingbirds. So there's not only the decks, there's this beautiful layout that, that Candace really led us into. And she really brought a huge impact, not only from her culture, but being a female, having that energy, and then having the, the contacts that she had. This show in Albuquerque at the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center that's happening until February 19th, 2023, it's closing, it's coming down. It's a must see. It's not going to last. It's very short. Okay. You're not okay. going to see a show s- like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Um, and I want to bring, uh, go back to our artists now. And Mallory, uh, Landis earlier, he mentioned you know, the mental health component and, and using this deck art as a way to promote issues and, and uh, other disparities in Native America. And I understand you actually, um, you do a lot of work artistic work with related to health sciences in health sciences setting there at the College of Pharmacy at the University of New Mexico. Can you talk more about that? How as an artist, you actually um, work in in other spaces to promote issues and causes? Yeah, so it's been a kind of a trailblazing um, situation, uh, creating this new um, dimension of work related to uh, communicating both science and health medicine. Um, it it kind of got its start with some of my artwork at the Zuni IHS hospital, a lot of anatomical artwork there, um, being discovered by the uh, PI, uh, Dr. Johnny Lewis at the College of Pharmacy. She She saw the work and said, hey, maybe there's a way we can take this and move it into the direction of um, informing Native communities, um, especially those uh, living in and around abandoned uranium mines. So I create artwork that um, comes from a really complex area such as, you know, um, biochemistry, uh, different kinds of aspects of how um, these heavy metals affect the human body and just how the environment works in general. But um, a lot of my other work is also um, about um, mental health issues, behavioral health, using sort of that art therapy aspect, but also making sure that we include traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous ways of knowing in our artwork, because that, as Elroy, you know, talks so um, greatly about how our imagery is really rooted in our, in our ancient stories, our migration stories, and this work just kind of gives, um, you know, shows the resilience of our people and these these designs, um, Landis had mentioned, you know, it's, it's basically like medicine um, creating. And so using these ideas of creativity and medicine, both um, Western science medicine and our own spiritual values as Native people, combining all of that and allowing that bridge to, to happen and to allow communication so that our, our people are um, better informed when it comes to their health care or they're informed if they're going to be a part of um, any kind of research studies, especially in genetics, things mm-hmm. that our own language does not have words for. Um, all our indigenous languages, especially in Zuni, which is one of a kind, we don't have words for DNA. We don't have words for <laughs> chemistry and all the... Um, all the different chemicals that exist in the world, we have to find other avenues. And art has been like one of the biggest ways. We're all visual learners. We learn through storytelling. So combining everything and putting it in, in this form has created that dialogue to happen between patient, provider, um, community members, and scientists. So that's kind of where the direction that I work in. Mallory, you and the other artists today are so inspirational. Where can listeners go to learn more about your work? Um, mine specifically, I'm more active on Instagram. I do have a 
Wakelet space as well. You can find through my Instagram. It's m.kwitowki.art, and you'll find me uh, active there. Okay. And Leanne, how about you? Where can listeners go and, and learn more about what you're, what you're doing? Um, I believe uh, I'm more active on Facebook. Uh, we do have our um, Idaki Art uh, Facebook page as well. Um, that's usually where we do also um, have our um, live, live streams of when we do sometimes our um, spray paint art, our paint pouring. So uh, a lot of people can really go there. Uh, we also answer any questions that anyone else has there. Okay, thank you. And Elroy, how about you? Where can we learn more about your work? Uh, you can find both Candace and I at our website. That's notachuink.com. That's N-A-T-A-C-H-U-I-N-K, like the pen. You can also find us on Instagram and Facebook. Another place you can find us is here at ZYEP, where I'm currently at. That's the Zuni Youth Enrichment Project. And we're all over the place. <laughs> Okay. And Candace, I'm, I'm imagining a listener on the show right now, maybe somebody who's artistic, but has never done any kind of artwork on a skateboard deck before, but they're fired up. They want to try it. Uh, where do they go? How do they take the next step to actually start doing some work on skateboard decks and maybe even getting their work uh, showcased in a show like what you and Landis are doing there in Albuquerque? Uh, sure. So if you want to learn how to or just get started with the boards yourself, uh, you can always get your boards from Amazon or your local skate shop. They always have plank decks there. Um, just start painting. Figure it out. Figure out what you like to do. I know it sounds or feels pretty weird the first time to work on a skateboard, especially since it's not flat like a canvas and it's kind of harder to work on. But once you get the hang of it, it's so much fun to think of different ideas to put on a board. So just go for it. Try it. And if you want to be part of the exhibit, uh, it's mostly, uh, how would I say, uh, like Landa said before, we just recruited off the people that we know, off of the roster of people. So I recruited a bunch of people that I knew in the art industry, but I like their style. Like, hey, I like you. Do you want to be in the exhibit? Paint a board for me. So that's pretty much what I did. But if you want to, okay. if I don't know you, and if you want to be involved, just find me on Instagram, Facebook, and let me know what you do. Now, you mentioned going to Amazon to get a board. Can you give us a rough idea of what a basic board would cost to, to start doing some artwork on? Uh, it costs about $15. $15 for a single one, about $75 for a seven-board seven uh, package or pack of boards. So. It just depends how much you want to spend. Okay, so that's pretty manageable. And you just need the deck, right? You don't need the trucks and the wheels and all that stuff, do you? Oh, you can do that if you want to. Go for it. Get crazy. <laughs> all right, let's do that. Let's get crazy on some skateboard deck art. Well, folks, I'm sorry, but we have reached the end of our hour. And I would like to thank our guest today, Landis Bahi, Candice Kwam, Elroy Natachu Jr., Mallory Kwitaki and Leanne as well for introducing their talents and, and sharing this exquisite world of native skateboard deck art. Just a wonderful conversation. We wish all of these folks well in their pursuits. Join us tomorrow for a show about the Great Salt Lake. The lake has connections to many tribes and it's disappearing. Are there solutions from a native perspective? I'm Sean Spruce. Thanks for listening to the one, the only Native America Calling.
Support by Indigenous Pact, a healthcare consulting company working to create health equity in Indian country. Indigenous Pact offers solutions to fit the needs of your tribe. Their team, experts in healthcare strategy, policy, and innovation, provides a one of a kind plan to solve the issues specific to your community. Indigenous Pact works to create three primary outcomes healing spaces, healthy citizens, and sustainable economies. More information at indigenouspact.com. Support your health care team. Enroll in health care coverage today. Contact your local Indian health care provider for more information. Visit healthcare.gov or call 1-800-318-2596. A message from Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service. Native America Calling is produced in the Annenberg National Native Voice Studios in Albuquerque, New Mexico by Kiwanak Broadcast Corporation, a native nonprofit media organization. Funding is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting with support from the Public Radio Satellite Service. Music is by Brent Michael Davis. Native Voice One, the Native American Radio Network.